So what if I told you you could get a keyboard that's designed exactly for your specific hand shape? Your exact preference in terms of number of keys uh, is affordable, is a split keyboard, is wireless Bluetooth, uh, and you can change it over time as your kind of ideas on what you want from a keyboard change. So it almost sounds too good to be true, but it is a real thing and it's really exciting. So in this video, we're gonna take a, a deep dive into the whole process. So this whole concept is probably the most significant kind of thing I've seen in terms of keyboard ergonomics, purely because it's so personal to you. You know, it's, it's exactly the keyboard that fits your hands and that's really something. And the real icing on the cake is just how easy it is to iterate these things over time. Because obviously, you know, as you work with these custom keyboards, you know, you wanna make changes to them. You might wanna think, oh, add a key or take a key away, um, you know, tweak things a little bit as you start to work with the keyboard. And you only get to do that once you've used them for some time, you know, only then do you kind of see where you want to make those changes. So the ability to make changes over a period of time, you don't have to think, okay, this is it, it's so expensive, I've got to like jump in and live with this forever. That's not the case at all with this. So if you're new to this channel, over the last few years, I've gone down this kind of rabbit hole of exploring ergonomic keyboards. I've looked at kind of a, a whole range of different uh, options and kind of ended up at this point here. And that really sums up my kind of interest in optimizing day-to-day -day workflows, which is what this channel is really all about. Uh, so do have a look around the channel and hopefully you'll agree it's worth subscribing. So as I've used all these different kind of keyboards over the last few years, I've really kind of evolved my preferences and uh, figured out what I want from a keyboard in terms of you know where I want keys and where I don't want keys. And I've really actually Gone, embraced the minimal keyboard layout and, and rejected keys of down to a single thumb key. And I'm, I'm currently actually working on a 16 key layout. Um, so I've, I've gone kind of nuts with that, but that's the, the point. This freedom, this flexibility allows you to go on your own journey of, of kind of figuring out what works for you here. So let's jump in. So basically the whole process revolves around three bits of software. The first is a kind of measuring tool that lets you come up with a rough idea of the kind of shape of the keyboard that you might want. So it runs on, a, on your iPad uh, or your tablet in the in, just in a browser and you tap the screen and it shows you what the keyboard might look like. Um, now the only issue with this is it, it does require multiple keys for each finger. So if you wanna go down to a single thumb position, it's a little bit harder to work out uh, where that position should be because it's based around the idea of showing you kind of three placements for each finger but you can get an idea and it's it's a pretty good tool just as a, a kind of introduction to what kind of shape you might want but of course you could use just pe a, you know paint and, on paper and just you know, mess about and see where you want your your keys to be for your particular hand shape and of course there's definitely no requirement to follow the output of this exactly you might make some changes you know for me i'll kind of valued the aesthetic of the board a little bit more than i did having a splay on the little finger for example uh, so i thought you know I'll, I'll stick with a grid for the keys rather than introduce the splay which this software would kind of suggest but yeah it's entirely up to you you can use it as much or as little as you want through this process so the next step, and this is where we get the big guns out, this is really the centerpiece of this whole process, this amazing bit of software called ErgoGen. Uh, and this lets you quite easily design all the CAD files that you need to get a PCB for your custom board printed. Um, and it, to see this sort of take shape in front of you when you're working with it is just super, super fun. Uh, so we're gonna take a look at that. So the third bit of software is KiCad, which is the sort of PCB layout tool um, for which ErgoGen makes the initial files. And then there's a little step that you finish things off in KiCad, and that's the routing where you kind of design where you want the actual routing for the connections between the things on the board to go. And that's actually quite a fun process. So um, that's the last step, but everything up to there is handled by ErgoGen. So getting started with ErgoGen and KiCad is quite daunting. It's uh, a bit of a learning curve, and but it's worth persevering with because once you've got the skill set, then that paves the way for you to iterate your boards over time, and you just you know you're, you're really geared up for this process of, of creating your own custom keyboard for now and as as time goes on. So I'll probably do a bit more of an in-depth walkthrough in another video, but for now I'm just going to kind of do a quick screen share uh, of the basic process, and that'll hopefully be enough to point you in the right direction, um, and I'll do more detail later. So I'm gonna run through the process of creating your own PCB here to, to create a keyboard just for you. Um, and this is ErgoGen. So this is the, the default kind of uh, web version of ErgoGen, uh, but there is actually another uh, unofficial version which has a live preview output. So I find this one a little bit easier to use uh, when you're working with the initial sort of setup of where you want the actual key positions. So in the documentation, it shows you how you can actually install it locally on your own machine. Um, but I find for the initial kind of setup of, of just sort of familiarizing yourself with the config file format, it's nice to use one of these web versions that are already hosted. You can just jump in and start changing stuff. Um, so this is the default code. You can see it's actually a single board uh, with both halves as part of the output. And that's as a result of this mirror 
uh, part of the config here. If you delete that, you can see it goes back to a single board. And that's the, the kind of format that I'm using because I'm going to make a flippable board where the same PCB can be used for either half of the keyboard. So if I jump back into my actual config file for the flipper keyboard here that I've built, uh, you can see I've got a bit more than what's in the sample code there. But if we just look at the zones section here, which is this board bit, if I paste that into here, so I'm going to delete everything from there. So I'm going to keep points and zones and then paste in my code here. If I'm still getting an error, it's almost certainly to do with the indentation. So if we get that fixed, we can see now here's my flipper keyboard. Um, and you can see basically it's a sort of collection of columns that have the offset. And you define those offsets using the stagger value here. And basically the way that works is the stagger value tells the column to be staggered compared to the previous column. So you start off with your pinky column that doesn't have a stagger value because it's the first one. And then you add the ring column and you set the stagger and then the middle and then you set the stagger and so on. And you create the stagger that you want for your columns. If you wanted a separate thumb cluster, you would actually define a new zone at the zone level. So I've just got one single uh, board zone here defined and that's all of these columns because I'm actually using my thumb key as part of the inner far column. And of course, I'm only using a single thumb key. And if you wanted to make a little fan of thumb keys, you would use another zone and define those as part of that. So once you're happy with the actual layout of your keyboard, you can then move into the version of ErgoGen that you install on your own machine. So you, you make sure you've got Node installed and so on. Install that. And then you're looking at um, an installation that looks a bit like this on your machine. And you can add a config file and start off with the code from the web view and then obviously start adding in all the other bits that you need. And that's mainly references to the footprints uh, and definitions for your outlines. So if we jump down here, we can see this outline section. Um, we're exporting three outlines. And then if you look at the PCB section, you can see that's uh, referencing the cutout outline that we use here. So you sort of define any, any outlines and then if you want to use those in the PCB export, you can reference them here. And then we're adding the footprints to the PCB here. Now we're also defining a footprint that we use per key. So we're going to use two footprints. We're going to use the hot swap one and then the normal one for the chalk uh, switches. So we set that up on a per key level here. And then we have the per PCB level for these remaining footprints at the bottom. Uh, so most of the kind of things you need for keyboards have already been added as footprints. I don't think you really need to add any custom footprints, but you can do that in here if you wanted to and you can get the code for those from um, the footprint files in KiCad uh, but basically most stuff is already here or if not in the main repository for Ergogen in, in one of the other people's branches you know people add their own footprints all the time uh, to their own branches so you can grab them from there and then you have to define the connections for the nets so that's basically you just use these values to connect everything up so obviously GND and RST represent pins on the controller footprint and that's how we then know that these things should be connected to those so once you're happy with your config file you can start building it and obviously this is the point where you're going to have to do probably a bit of trial and error. So if we uh, jump back to the command line here, we can build it with a command like this. So we're just literally calling this file and then supplying it with the name of the config file. And when you do that, you get this little uh, output here. And then if you jump into the finder, you can see in the output folder, we've got this file which has been generated. So that's our main PCB file. So to get that to work, you have to kind of make a placeholder project in KiCad. Uh, so if we do file new project in KiCad, and then you can kind of just add a new project placeholder in the ErgoGen folder or anywhere else really. So we can see we've got that there. And then what you want to do is drop your new KiCad file into that project folder. And you can see it there and double click it. And then that opens that in PCB new. And that's how you actually edit the file itself. So you can see we're almost there, almost looking like we've got a full PCB here. The only thing that's missing is the connections between the components. So you can see these white lines that are just straight lines. That's based on the net. So that was where we, we defined the connections um, for the net values. And that shows us which bit needs to connect to which. And we can do that using the routing tool. So using this tool here, we get to see one side of the PCB at a time. We can see the front or the back. So if we stick to the front, we can then start drawing our connections. So single click on one, 
and it tells you where it needs to go. It grays out everything else, tells you which thing it needs to connect to, and it's this red one over here. And then that needs to connect to the through hole here, and you can see this then needs a connection. If we switch on this mode, we can see it a little bit clearer. So we could just jump straight across and connect that up. And now you can see this red line is going to a pad that's on the other side of the PCB here. So we've got this sort of white line that, that goes from here to, to nowhere. Um, so we can do that by going through the through holes on the switch. So obviously these through holes are accessible from either side. So if we jump to the back, we can click here and we can connect it to that pad. So we know that through hole is connected on the other side of the board to this one. So we, from here, then we can use the pad that's on this side. Obviously the pads are only connectable on the side that they're on, whereas the through holes connect right through. So by connecting that to here, we've completed that part of the circuit. So this pin on the controller, uh, pin nine, connects to this pad on this side of the board, this pad on the other side of the board, and then both of these through holes. And that leaves this one which uh, needs to be connected to ground, and this t uh, this pad which also needs to be connected to ground. And again, we can use the through hole to jump to the other side and then connect that to that ground. All the grounds basically need to be connected together and then come back to the ground pins, of which there are three on the controller here. That also connects to the negative battery connection point I've put here as well. So you could just kind of do that and then you can start connecting them up and you can just sort of do that sort of thing and carry on on both sides. I, I tend to find it easier to, to work with the ground on one side and the connections on the other. So what I'm going to do now is just jump into some ones that I've finished earlier. So I'm going to open another project now. So this is basically once you've finished all the routing. So there's a little bit where you're going back and forth and you're working out which pin needs to connect to which switch so that you don't have to keep crashing into other routes. You know, you need to be able to sort of do it like this where the, where the routing can reach the the switches without having to go under or over other connections all the time and um, you can you can do that with the vias but obviously it gets really complicated so you want to try and minimize that so there's a little bit of back and forth where you decide which switch connects to which pin and that's where you define those connections in your config file by setting the values in the column net values for each of the points on the keyboard so each each of these switches references a pin on the controller and that's how that net is designed. So once it's at this level, you could actually just export this and upload it straight away to the PCB manufacturer, but it's it's nice to put a bit of polish on it. Um, and we can use some plugins in KiCad to make this look a little bit nicer. So there's a teardrops plugin, which I've installed here, and that basically just rounds these connections to the through holes. So if I jump back to the version where I've actually got that done, we can zoom in, we can see how that works. So you can see whenever there's a connection to a through hole, we get this nice rounding teardrop effect. But what would make it look even nicer is to round off some of these tracks as well. So there's a plugin for that, uh, which you can see here. We've got this round the tracks option from the uh, plugin that I'm using there. I'll link to all of this stuff in the description. But basically, if we jump into the version of that that I've got, where I've got the rounding and the teardrops, we can start to see things are looking a bit, a bit more polished now. So to upload that to a PCB printer, you just need to do plot, generate the drill files, and then run the plot. And then back in the finder, we can see inside the Gerber folder, we've got these files that have just been created. And then it's just a question of creating a zip out of that folder. And then you can actually just upload that file to a PCB printer. And it's as simple as that. Uh, you set up some basic options as to what kind of colors and thickness you want. Um, I've actually experimented with thinner ones as well. As, you know, you can you can get away with 1.2, um, but there you get a little preview of the front and back there. Uh, you can choose your colors. So this is a flippable board, so it works as either the left or the right. Um, and you have to order five of these as the minimum order. So you get enough for two and a half boards with your order. Uh, some of the comments before suggested it's, it's best to use the lead free options, which do cost a little bit more, but not by a, a lot. So once you get the PCBs through the post, you have to solder it all together. And that's actually not a big deal. Um, if you're following this kind of outline that, that I'm working with here, the idea is you've got uh, hot swap sockets on the back of the board. You use a battery connector and you use sockets for the control controller. So you just solder those onto the board and then you get to obviously reuse your controller later if you want to change the board. So soldering the hot swap connectors onto the back of the board really, really fast, really simple. Um, that's a really easy process to do. Um, obviously soldering a connector on for the battery is also pretty simple. And then the sockets are a little bit fiddly, but you know, that, that's not the end of the world. Uh, it obviously lets you reuse those controllers. So it's a worthwhile process.
So the idea being that if you change the design of the board, all you've got to do is pull the switches and the controller off, disconnect the battery, uh, and then you create your new kind of version of the board and put it all back on again. So you're not soldering switches all the time. You're not doing any desoldering either, and, but you still get to preserve the controller and your switches. So the only thing we're replacing when we change this in the future is really just the board and the hot swap sockets on the back and the sockets for the controller. Um, they're all very cheap. You know, the whole process of the board and the, and the sockets on the back, super cheap compared to the switches and the controllers themselves, which we can preserve. So once you've got the hardware sorted, you're ready to put the firmware on. If you're using the nice nanos and running ZMK like I am here, uh, you need to build a shield for your board, which is the file that ZMK uses when you build your firmware. So if you've installed ZMK for an existing board, uh, you'll know it's got this really nice build process that uses the GitHub Actions system. So that's fantastic. So once you've done that, you actually can then turn that into your own custom shield. So it explains quite nicely here, if you're working with this um, GitHub Actions approach to building the firmware, this uh, the way you deal with shields is slightly different. You're not actually adding them into an app directory, you're putting them into the config directory in your GitHub project. Um, so it just tells you to replace app with config wherever you see it here. So if I jump into my GitHub project here, I can show you how that looks. So you can see basically the, you know, you just, you've just got this single config file uh, when you're using this GitHub approach. Uh, if we look in there, you can see that's basically the sort of format that you do to add the shield. So I kind of just copied these and renamed them accordingly from one of the default ones. So you can kind of do the same thing to, to do this. So the key one is this DTSI file, and that's where you actually uh, decide on your layout that you will then sort of map the ZMK config to the actual switch positions on your board. So you're kind of connecting the position of the keys to the pins that you've used in your net. So you decide which pin corresponds to which switch basically here, and that needs to match the net that you built in, in KiCad. So you create a kind of array of, um, of positions here, and then numerically from left to right, you define these. Now, because it's a flippable board, obviously, you're not doing all of these, you only go up to half. So basically, because we're working with these small boards, we're not using an actual matrix. So the matrix is actually just the, you know, as far as ZMK is concerned, it's a single row keyboard um, with 26 columns. So you, you're essentially just listing these keys out from left to right. And then where we define a new row, you're actually just carrying on as far as ZMK is concerned. And then you say which key corresponds to which pin on the controller by putting the numbers in here. Now, obviously, you haven't actually got this many pins because we're using a flippable board. So the board flips over and goes backwards for the other side. But ZMK just handles all of that automatically. So you do the first, um, you know, the first sort of half and then on the right overlay file, you say where the column offset should start. So you, you split the board in half and you put the offset as that number. And that then obviously then makes it sort of remap it. And then once you've done that, you can obviously then work on your key map file. So with your key map file, uh, it just automatically maps it now. So you just go again, you sort of, you can lay this out. Uh, in rows and columns as you would normally with a key map file and that will automatically map to the right keys on the board. And then obviously using the ZMK build process, all you do is commit this back to your GitHub. So this is the GitHub project. So once you've committed it, you can jump into actions and you can see um, the latest action uh, that's been run. Scroll down to the bottom there and you can download this firmware file. And then you just put the keyboard into bootloader mode by double resetting so to clicking the reset button on these boards where we've actually got a special switch for the reset button you can double click it that puts the board into the bootloader mode and you just drop this file from the computer onto the board and that's enough to flash it and you only need to do that on your left half once you've done it initially on both halves you can change the key map quite easily just by changing the left half you only have to flash the left half um, it's only the sort of top level config that you need to do initially on both halves obviously so I've done this twice so far. The first one was this one that I called the flipper. Uh, looks a little bit like a flipper and obviously it's a reversible board, so yeah, it seemed appropriate. And then the next one I did was the card, which is this kind of super minimal credit card sized keyboard. Um, and the next one I do after that will be this ultra minimal, super small one that'll work with my 16 key layout. But of course it's fiddling with these designs that lets the layout evolve and you can kind of keep up with your layout in the hardware as well, which is fantastic. So as I mentioned earlier, Ergogen lets you actually create 3D models to generate cases for these things as well. I haven't done that yet, but that's kind of a whole you know extra area of fun that you can have uh, when you're using Ergogen.
So let me know in the comments below if you've done this or you are excited about doing it now you've seen the video or if there's anything I missed and you'd like me to look at it in a bit more detail in another video, I can definitely try and do that. So thanks for watching and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.